The reading today is from Revelation 22, verse 7, and also John 14, verses 1 to 11. Look, I am coming, so blessed, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. And John, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to be prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to me to be with me, that you also may be with I, I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even that after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has, been, has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Good morning, everybody. Today is already a good day because I wasn't made to use the same microphone as my 12-year-old son and lift it lower. <laughs> that day's coming way too quickly. Um, this morning, I think, I think the intention was to look, talk about the passage in Revelation 22, 7, which talks about Jesus saying, I'm coming soon. That's a great message. It's got exciting headlines, hasn't it? It's about Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming soon. We're going to be with him in heaven forever. We're no longer going to be strangers in the land, going from place to place, feeling we don't really fit in. Um, we can talk about whether we're each going to get our own harp, our own cloud. Am I going to be tall, have more hair? All these really good, exciting things. But, you know, when I was thinking about this passage, it's something I've been thinking about for quite a while. I kept coming back to one key question. And I'll pause here, because like I've said, I think, times before when I'm speaking, I always get slightly nervous. Because this one key question says something about me and what I'm thinking. And if you guys aren't thinking the same thing, I'm going to stand here looking dreadful. So just go along with me. Otherwise, it's going to be a long 15 minutes. The key question I keep coming back to is this. How well do we know the one who is coming back? Let me say that again. How well do we really know the one who is coming back? Because knowing the full context of something can be extremely powerful, can't it? There's another old hymn, which I love. And it says this, it's called Love That Will Not Let Me Go. Do people know that one? Yeah, it's a fabulous one, lousy tune. It's, O love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O light that followest all my way, I yield my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its burrowed ray, that in thy sunshine's blades its day may brighter, fairer be. O joy that seekest me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I trace the rainbow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. That morn shall tearless be. Isn't that gorgeous words? But when you know the back story to it, it becomes even more powerful. It was written um, on the evening of the author's sister's marriage. And his whole family had gone to the wedding and left him alone. And, you know, that sounds fine. But... This was a guy who years before had been engaged until his fiancée at the very last moment learned that he was going blind. This is back in the 18th, 19th century, so you can imagine how tough life would be then. And there was nothing the doctors could do to help him. And she told him, I'm sorry, I just can't go through with a life with a blind person. It's too hard. And he went blind while studying for the ministry, which meant he couldn't do, become the teacher that he wanted to become. And it was his sister, this sister who had just gone off to get married, that had been the one who had taken care of him all these years. 
And now, on this day, she'd be leaving their home to start her new life. And all those memories would have come flooding back of when his fiancée had jilted him at the last moment. And now he faced a future, blind, alone, with nothing to really fall back on. And the reason I say all that is context, background, is so important, isn't it? To fully understand the true meaning of words such as written as him. If you read that poem again later on in that context, it brings tears to your eyes. It's that powerful. Now, we know an awful lot probably about Jesus' time here on earth, don't we? We know where he was born. Ali wanted to do this as a pop quiz. I won't do that. We know where he was born, we know how old he was when he died roughly, Uh, we know um, about his miracles, we know about his death, we know about his friends, we know a lot about some of the things he said. And yet the passage in John that Ollie read for us before touches on something that probably, and this is my point of hesitation, probably we know very little, if anything, about. And that's his relationship with the Father, And later on in that chapter, John 14, he goes on to talk about his relationship with the Holy Spirit as well. Because here, Jesus is referring to what we now refer to as the Trinity. That is, God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each person being fully God, and the fact that there is only yet one God, there's not three gods. Now, I recognize on a sunny day when you're hoping to talk about heaven and Jesus coming soon, this is where you switch off for the next 15 minutes till we come back to communion. I get that. There's a lot of people who might say, look, I know enough already about my relationship with Jesus to focus on. There's enough to feed me here. I don't need to go too far far on this. There may be others who say, look, Trinity is just way too difficult for me to understand. I struggle with understanding the end of Sherlock. Never mind these kind of things. And then there's others who say, well, that's just about intellectual head knowledge. That gets in the way of a proper relationship with Jesus. You know, put those things aside. I want to challenge that. I'm so glad I think it was Penny who prayed at the end. It's like challenge us today. Because that's what I'm going to do. It's going to challenge us. There may not be nice soft stories today. It's going to be a challenge to step back and think about some of these things. And the reason I want to challenge us on it is, number one, God himself has chosen to reveal himself in the form of the Trinity. It's not something that theologians have come with over the years to make Christianity more exciting, more enjoyable, more interesting. God himself has revealed himself to us in this form. And it's significant to him. And that means it must be significant to us, doesn't it? Imagine you go out on a first date, a long time ago, and the person you're sitting opposite starts telling you the most intimate things which are important to them about their background, their relationships with other people, some of the things which are their idiosyncrasies, explaining the backstory to those things. Imagine if at that moment you just started picking over your pastor, clearly not listening, say, sorry? Now you do that after 20, 30 years and you still get in trouble. But on a first date, (laughs) even worse. Because if it matters to the other person and you're trying to understand that person, it matters to you to understand it, doesn't it? It's no more complicated than that. So I want to get rid of this idea about this being intellectual head knowledge. This is much richer and more important than that. There are other good reasons that the Trinity and understanding the Trinity and at least examining the Trinity is important. It's one of the most important distinguishing doctrines of Christianity. But it's also central to our understanding about creation and about our salvation. Look at creation. There we know it was God the Father who spoke the creative words, wasn't it, in Genesis 1. But then it was God the Son who carried out the creative decrees. You look at me and say, huh? It's John 1 verse 3. It says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then the Holy Spirit? Well, the Holy Spirit was clearly present at the time of creation. It talks of the Holy Spirit hovering, moving over the face of the earth. In Genesis 1 verse 2. Similarly, if you look in salvation, you see the Trinity operating there too. You see that the Father planned the redemption and sent his Son into the world. We see that in the well-known verse in John 3, verse 16, don't we? That God sent his Son. And then we know that the Son obeyed his Father and accomplished salvation. 
I am going to give a few um, verses out this morning. If you're going to take anything away, take those verses away, because this stuff's much better. Hebrews 10, um, verse 5 to 7 says this. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. And then I said, Here I am. It's written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. So that was the role of the Son. And what about the Holy Spirit? Well, critical role. The Holy Spirit then came to apply salvation to us, to give regeneration, we refer to it, or new spiritual life. Again in in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. Jesus said, Faith truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So in those two fundamental things to our whole essence, our whole being, our creation and our salvation, we see three persons of the Godhead, three persons of the Trinity operating together. Similarly, in our worship, understanding the Trinity is pretty critical. We have to understand the relationships and roles of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, including even how to pray. Wasn't it Jesus who said, this is how you should pray. You pray to the Father, through the Son, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fundamental. We pray on a daily basis. And we're told that involves the Trinity. We should understand the Trinity in that instance. I can guess without looking at anyone in particular, Peter. Um, it's not enough to convince you yet that we really should try and drill down on some of these issues. But by failing to tackle the Trinity, we risk losing something. We lose the opportunity to marvel who the Father, who the Son, and who the Holy Spirit truly are. Ah. It's a little bit like, I was trying to find an analogy for this, and it's really hard to do so, but I think the, the closest I came is, you know, you look up and you see a star. And it's breathtaking, isn't it? When you see a star in, like, a clear sky. And it's so bright, you know it's millions of miles away. And it's huge, but it's just twinkling up there. And it's like, wow. It's like seeing that and being in awe. But never taking the time to turn around, look up, and see the whole galaxy. All the stars reached across, you know? Because we're just saying, that's enough for me. And yet there's this whole galaxy about who God really is that we can understand and enjoy. Now you'd be relieved that I'm not going to try and teach the Trinity this morning. Um, But instead I just want to look at one aspect. And that's the one we looked at really in, in John 14. And it's one aspect of the relationships within the Godhead. And it's that between the Son and the Father. And what I want to do, and be blatant, is just to whet our appetite. That we really say, I really want to try and understand some of these fabulous truths. So we begin to turn around, look up, and say, I want to see the galaxy of stars. And really understand God in his entirety. So the relationship between the Son and the Father. Let me read again, again, just briefly, um, John 14, verses 6 and 7 only. John 14, verses 6 and 7. 6 to 7. 6 to 11 even. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That would be enough for us. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time. Anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe I'm the Father? The Father is in me. The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it's the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. It's always encouraging, isn't it, the disciples? Because they do that role for us that they mess up and they misunderstand. So it's okay for us to say as well, we don't really understand the Trinity. Disciples didn't hear when they were even spending time with Jesus himself. There's two themes from this passage that I just want briefly to look at together. The first one's going to be the submission of the Son to the authority of the Father. And then the second one's going to be the intimacy of the relationship 
between the Father and the Son. Before talking about the submission of the Son to the Father, I want to just remind ourselves of certain fundamental truths about Jesus. Because the temptation here, as soon as we start talking about his role with the Father, we misunderstand and misinterpret something of who Jesus is. So it's good to remind ourselves about those fundamental truths. Does that make sense? Those fundamental truths is Jesus is fully God. End of story. He possesses the divine nature of God equally and fully with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. He is not one third God. He's fully God with them. That's really important. Secondly, Jesus is defined not by his nature, but by his role as son in relation to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. His relationships with each of them. And thirdly, and again, this, we can never lose sight of this. And I do want to read the three verses in Ephesians. You may want to turn out Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. And carry this thought right the way through as we look at these two issues concerning the relationship between the Father and the Son. Ephesians 1, 20 to 23. Read from 19. His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that's invoked, not only in the present age but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Whenever we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about the one who died for our sins, ascended to heaven, and sits in triumph at the right hand of the Father. So let's just get those things cemented down. Those are fundamental truths about Jesus, which anything we say must be interpreted within that context. So that said, let's look at the two things. First of all, Jesus did submission to the Father. We often talk about the beauty of Jesus as a servant king, don't we? But the concept of him being in submission to the Father is one, find some, is one that some find it hard, actually, to accept. Because we now generally find the idea of authority and submission restrictive, outdated, bigoted. We assume that if you're taking on a role subject to another's authority... That means there's inequality in the essence of those people because of the roles they're taking. And it's not even surprising that we perceive things that way, is it? Because in our 21st century, there is so much abuse of authority. And often roles are used to create superiority and impress others. It's just a fact. It's badly applied. It's badly done. It's used as a tool. And yet... The Son's submission to the authority of the God the Father is a fundamental truth of who God is. It's a fundamental truth of who God is. If you've got a Bible, turn to John chapter 8. John chapter 8, and verse Verse 23 and then verse 28 and 29. Verse 23, this is Jesus speaking. You're from below, I'm from above. You're of this world, I'm not of this world. And then verse 28 and 29. Jesus said, when you lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he and I do nothing on my own but speak just when the Father has taught me. The one who has sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. So that's Jesus talking when it's time on earth, isn't it? See, on the one hand, in that verse 23, he confirms very directly that he is God. He's from above, he's not from here. And yet in the very next breath, he says that he does nothing of his own authority. If you look at the words nothing, and he also says always as well, they're signifying complete, comprehensive, and absolute submission to the Father's authority. And yet, you could never say that Jesus 
was in bondage to the Father. Look at John 14, 32 to 34. Sorry, John 4, 32 to 34. And the reason I want to keep going back to the Bible on this is I don't want you to think that we're just coming out with some nice similes and piecing them together. This is what it says in the Gospels about who Jesus is. Verse 32. But he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. See, sorry. Disciples had come to him and said, you must be hungry, you've had a long day. He said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. His disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? Great typical mistake by the disciples. And verse 34, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. See, Jesus was thriving on fulfilling the work of the Father, wasn't he? It's describing as his sustenance, what gives him energy, what gets him through the day. That's not someone who's saying, I'm down here, I get these edicts across from the Father, I'm in bondage, I do what I'm told, I hate doing it, I drag my feet. This is someone who feeds upon it. It's opposite to how we think of authority and submission, isn't it? Often, whether it's in the workplace or elsewhere. Now, it would be convenient, doctrinally, to say, get it, makes sense, when Jesus came to earth, he emptied himself of his deity, put himself in submission to the Father, so that makes sense why that occurred on earth. Got it. That would be fabulous on one level, wouldn't it? Because it makes it easy for us to understand, because it's temporal. But the problem with that is it's not biblical either. Um... If you read in Philippians where it talks about emptying himself, at no point did Jesus put aside his deity. Never. May have suppressed it in his humanity, never put aside his deity. And more than that, the Bible is really clear that the differences in the roles between God the Father and God the Son were not just temporal while here on earth, but were in eternity past and will be so in eternity in the future. And again, I don't want it to be just what I'm saying. Let's look at what it says in the Bible. In John 3, we already looked at verses 16 and 7, it says that the Father sent his Son into the world, doesn't it? So it's clear that that submission authority was already in place, such that the Father could send his Son. Similarly, in John chapter 6, verse 38, I've come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. It's the Father who sends the Son. And that was there in eternity past already. And in 1 Peter, it talks about that being placed before the foundation of the world. It's very, very clear. You may say, well, that's great, Phil. Um, so in the past, in the present, but surely it's going to change in the future when this whole doctrine of salvation thing is complete and done. No. It's the same going to be an eternity future. If you read 1 Corinthians 15, it's great verses. I had a look to them. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 to 28. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. It's talking about Jesus. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he's done this, then his son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. In Philippians, it talks about every tongue acknowledging that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, it's a pretty big issue, isn't it? It's a pretty big issue. Understanding that part of who Jesus is. That he's putting himself in submission to the Father. And the Father is exercising authority over the Son. And yet they're all equal. They're all part of one Godhead. So does that mean, and people have commented on this, and maybe it's why we shy away from it, does that mean that Jesus lives and always will live in a tyrannical relationship with his Father? But far from it. Again, in the Gospels it talks that Jesus says that he he does his, uh, sorry, that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me, commanded me. See, Jesus' obedience, and it's clear elsewhere, is driven by a deep love for the Father. To show the world how much he loves his Father. And of course, that love, we talk about the love of the Lord Jesus quite rightly, and often we focus in that love towards us. And the fact it was that great love that took him to Calvary to die for us that he was willing to submit to the cross. 
But do we ever consider the other reason that Jesus went to the cross was out of love for God the Father? Because that's what he's saying here. His obedience was driven by his love for his Father. And that's by one who is yet fully God, who had the full nature of God embodied in him. It gives a whole different dimension, doesn't it, of the cross? Because it's not just about that love flowing down to us. For our salvation, to save us from our sins, you're seeing an act of enormous depth of love between the Son and the Father. The greatest demonstration of that love from the Son towards the Father. Does that mean it was a one-way street? That you still had a tyrannical father, but as a son so willing to please? No. The love is clearly reciprocated. And Jesus acknowledges that himself. He says to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Because I've known the love of my Father, this is the way I can show my love and demonstrate my love towards you in the same way. One of the greatest demonstrations of the love that Jesus had for his Father, sorry, that the Father had for Jesus, was entrusting the Son to go to Calvary. Let me say that again. One of the greatest demonstrations of the Father's love towards the Son was entrusting the Son to go to Calvary. We looked at that passage in uh, Philippians, I think, earlier on. And it talks about the Son being exalted, doesn't it, above everything. The Father wanted the Son to be exalted. The Father wanted him to be above all things. And by allowing him and enabling him to go through Calvary, that's how he would be put above all things. It says this in Philippians 2. See, the Father wanted the best for his Son. He could see beyond the cross and see where that would put the Son. And that's a love we just can't get our heads around. How he could allow the Son to go through the cross people like us. But through it, he could see something even greater for his son. See, it's my shame I've never spent much time really to un- trying to understand the relationship between the father and the son. But just by scraping the surface, because that's all we've done, we scrape the surface. I'm astounded by the depth of love that exists between them. I'm astounded by Jesus' submission to the father. The fact that he was wholehearted in his desire to obey fully the instructions of the Father. There's no indication anywhere they only said, yep, I've got it, I'm willing to obey now. There was no verification of what the Father was doing. And more than that, Jesus found a deep-rooted satisfaction, his sustenance, in obeying the Father's will. You know, we often think of Jesus as being the greatest martyr, quite rightly. He was a martyr. He gave up his life for, for us. Yeah. But within the Godhead, there's not that sense of martyrdom, is there? Isn't there that sense of passionate love that drove him to obey the Father? Not, but I've got to go through this, and oh dear. It's my, I want to obey my Father. And for the father, well, his overriding concerns we touched on was to see his son exalted. He could look beyond the cross. He wanted the best for him, even beyond the cross. Now, this concept of authority submission in such a loving relationship sounds so countercultural today. But I wonder what it means to us. And I'm not going to go into depth because I think it's way too heavy to um, a subject to try and tie off in five minutes. But I think it's something that we should examine, we should try and understand. For the reasons we talked about right at the beginning, it matters to God. There's a depth there that should enrich our understanding of God. But it also has a day-to-day application for us. It has a day-to-day application in our marriages, where there's a relationship between a husband and wife is described elsewhere as a relationship between the father and the son. The more we understand the relationship between the father and the son, the more we should try and understand what marriage really is and isn't. It's our approach to church government. You know, church is described as many members, one body, isn't it? It has that diversity of the Trinity. But what does that really mean? 
in terms of church governance, where we put ourselves under authority of other people, or we recognise each other's gifts, or even just on the day-to-day when we help each other out. We have someone, Muriel and Paul, doing such a cracking thing with Holiday at Home. The extent we come in and say, you know, I'm going to submit, Paul Muriel, tell me exactly what you need to do, I'll just do it. And I'll do it wholeheartedly, full stop. What about in our approach to work? Authority at work and submission is such a tough thing. I hate authority at work. I hold my hands up to it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not good with it. Um, but equally, people aren't great submitting themselves to my authority, so it's kind of above and beyond. But if we were trying to apply the Christian principles that we see in the Godhead about what authority and submission mean, what a witness that would be. When people come to us and say, but why do you, don't you just whine and whinge when it's just a stupid decision? Well, why, do you, when someone's doing a really menial role under your authority, do you treat them as an equal? And so, well, that's what authority and submission biblically is supposed to be like, isn't it? Just imagine if we could apply that, what the witness would be in the workplace and else why. And what about in our families? We talk about marriage, but what about with the way we treat our children, where there is a role of authority, isn't there? Not so much submission, it would be great if there was. But do you know what I mean? About how we go about it. And even with our our own parents, who may be older now, how do we interact with them? Do we still recognise their authority, even when they have a different role in our lives? We're constantly fed the line today that free choice, individualism, independence allow us to love. When we've got those things, I'm willing to love. I can love. But isn't the love here between the Lord Jesus and God the Father the truest form of love in a, t- in a model which we're told exists from eternity past to eternity future. A son whose desire is to demonstrate his passion to obey his father such that it took him to the cross. A father willing to allow and experience his son enduring the cross so that one day his son would be exalted to the highest place. And all this love and all the pain that it involved takes place in the essence and the being of one God, not three gods. We read in Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, he's coming soon. But until he does, may we just grow in our understanding of him and the Father and of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God and our Father, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for the, the consistency, the coherency and the power of the word. But we ask that Through your Holy Spirit, you help us to understand it. Help us not just to settle on the surface, but help us to drill down, to really get to grapple with these deeper truths. Help us to understand more of the relationship um, between you, Father, and the Son. Help us to understand more of what took place on Calvary, not just insofar as it relates to us and our salvation, but what happened between you, Father, and the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. There will just be an awe of all that you are, Father God. There will be awe of your depth and mystery. And Father, we pray that when we remain as head knowledge, that we'll bring it down, we'll understand that the model you've given us within the Trinity is something directly applicable of how we live our lives, how we can relate to you, how we can find contentment in you. So we thank you as we now come to your table in Jesus' name.